the universe. It's composed of matter, space, and energy. So, the Big Bang Theory, right? Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state and nearly 14 billion years ago expansion started. Wait! So, if this expansion is called the Big Bang, what made the Big Bang model accepted? Well, one, the cosmological redshift demonstrated a shift in the galaxy's spectrum lines at the low frequency red end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Therefore, galaxies are not moving around in space, but rather, space itself is expanding and dragging the other galaxies along with it. Two, another reason for the acceptance of the Big Bang was the cosmic microwave background. 500,000 years after the Big Bang, there was remaining red-shifted microwave radiation due to the universe being so heated. So just think of the remaining red-shifted microwave radiation as if it was the remaining food splatters in your microwave when you heat up your meal way too much. Third, there was a three to one ratio of hydrogen to helium in stars and interstellar matter predicted by the Big Bang. With all that said, the top theory of the evolution of the universe is the inflationary model of the Big Bang. However, we still have not discovered completely what triggered the Big Bang, but we predict if there was a beginning, there has to be an end. So in our solar system, planets revolve on their axis and revolve around the sun. The majority of our planets have a prograde rotation, which goes in a counterclockwise rotation. However, the oddball planets Venus and Uranus move in a clockwise rotation known as retrograde rotation. In addition to rotation, the planets also revolve. And the time it takes for the planets to revolve around the sun is called the sidereal period. Bessel proved that the Earth revolves around the sun by observing parallax. Hey guys, I want you to try this activity on your screen. So close your right eye and put your thumb out in front of you and cover up the earth on your screen. All right, I want you to open your right eye and close your left eye. Are you still covering up that earth? No, right? This simple activity demonstrates parallax, which is the position or direction an object appears when seen from different positions. But wait, let's rewind. Now we're we now know a great portion of what the universe consists of, so let's backtrack. Roughly 73% of mass and energy of the universe is energy. And roughly 23% is matter. But the crazy thing is that the rest of the 4 to 5% is all of the other matter in the universe that is visible to us. Not only can we see such a small portion of the universe, but our senses are limited. Our senses are so limited that we can't distinguish the difference between stars and the planets in our solar system, and as a result, they just appear to us as visible light. Our vision is not the only sense that is limited to us. Our touch, hearing, taste, and smell are all limited to us as well. Just to give one more example of how our senses can be limited, imagine this scenario. A mom is cooking dinner on the stove, so the mom tells her son, little Henry, Now Henry, don't touch the stove. It is very hot. However, once the mom turns her back away from little Henry, guess what he does? He reaches his hand onto the stove and all you hear is, Youch! This scenario demonstrates that our touch senses are limited because if we touch something too cold, or in this case, too hot, then we are going to be brutally injured and must be rushed to the emergency room. Yikes. So, moving away from the physical sciencey things, let's talk about the actual physics of the universe. So, what is physics? Well, it is simply the principles and the concepts that describe the workings of the universe. To get more into the specifics, let's talk about the three laws of Newton's laws of motion. Newton's first law of motion. This is where an object at rest will stay at rest, just like this rock. Geology. Or an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted by an external force. 
This law is helped out with something known as inertia, which is the resistance to change in motion. For instance, little Henry is in space, and he throws a baseball in space. Due to inertia in Newton's first law of motion, the baseball would forever keep moving in the direction it was thrown in space, with the exception that there was no external force that would hit or affect it because an object in motion will stay in motion. Alright, so Newton's second law of motion is where acceleration equals the net force on an object divided by the mass of an object. To apply this second law into reality, think of an empty shopping cart compared to a shopping cart full of boxes. Which one will be easier to push? Well, the cart with nothing in it is easier to push because it has less mass than the shopping cart with all of the boxes. Therefore, the empty shopping cart will have more acceleration because there is less force applied to push the empty shopping cart. Alright, so we talked about Newton's first law and second law. What about Newton's third law of motion? The third law simply states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, when an object exerts force on a second object, the second object will exert equal and opposite force on the first object. So, imagine a person jumping on a trampoline. When a person jumps down on a trampoline and the trampoline springs back up, the person will be bounced up into the air. This means when a person jumped down on the trampoline, it exerted an equal and opposite force when they were sprung back up from the trampoline. Now that we've learned about some physics, let's take a step backwards and learn how physics developed over time. Classical music, I mean, classical physics, was discovered before 1900, which dealt with large-scaled objects. Then, modern family, I mean, modern physics, was discovered in the 1900s, where scientists observed stranger things. I mean, strange things about atoms. An atom is where each chemical element is composed of tiny, indivisible particles known as subatomic particles, which is the proton, neutron, and electron. Doc Thompson, scratch that, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, and Ernest Rutherford discovered that 99.9% .9 of an atom's mass is concentrated in the nucleus, which contains protons and neutrons, also known as nucleons. As well, electrons surround the nucleus. The outermost level is known as the valence shell, which contains the valence electrons. Valence electrons determine the chemical reactivity of the element. All of the elements strive to become Noble gases! Because noble gases are highly non-reactive due to the satisfaction of fulfilling the octet rule, meaning that they have eight valence electrons in the outermost valence shell. Well, I hope you guys learned more about the fundamentals of physical science. Catch you on the fly, Cardinals! Chabra!